Cool. My name's Dave Liebenberg. I am a senior threat analyst at Talos. Talos is the threat intelligence arm of Cisco. Within Talos, I'm on a team called the Threat Interdiction Team, which is basically a hunting team. And uh, within that team, my team focuses on the Asia Pacific. And my work specifically focuses on China. And the reason for that is, is that I speak, read, write Chinese, uh, lived in China for several years, and have worked on China for a long, long time. And uh, very happy to be speaking to you all today. And uh, it's great to be in Switzerland, in Zurich, beautiful city. So thanks for having me. Today we're going to be talking about uh, illicit mining of the cryptocurrency Monero by Chinese cyber criminals. In many ways, this represents sort of a shakeup of a underground market that was once predominantly geared towards DDoS, while using a lot of the same tools and infrastructure that was used from DDoS to start illicit mining operations. I want to uh, issue a caveat up front that when I say Chinese, what I mean to say is Chinese speaking, since it can be difficult to precisely ascertain where the actor is originating from, be it mainland China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, the diaspora, etc. So here's a brief outline of what I'll be uh, talking to you guys about today. I'm going to start off with just some basics about mining, about mining Monero, why threat actors have become interested in Monero recently. Then we'll look at specifically the Chinese perspective, uh, why and how and when Chinese actors start getting interested in this. Then since a lot of my job involves going through Chinese hacking forums and social media and stuff like that, I'll provide some examples of chatter I've seen that have sort of demonstrated this growing trend in Monero mining campaigns. We'll also look at some attacks in progress as well as some tools that you can buy on Chinese forums. After that sort of attacker perspective, we'll flip it and get a look at how these attacks play out by looking at some observations from our Talos honeypots. Then to illustrate the scale and the profitability of some of these uh, campaigns, uh, we'll take a look at some big Monero mining botnets that have been attributed to some Chinese speaking cyber criminals. And finally, we'll end with uh, mitigations what we do, what you guys can do, and uh, some major takeaways. So high level, what is mining? Mining is basically using system resources to solve complex mathematical equations that result in some amount of cryptocurrency being rewarded to the solver. As an example, Bitcoin, one of the most popular cryptocurrencies, uh, has been mined since its inception. Although mining Bitcoin now is, uh, well, it's difficult because it's so resource intensive. Basically now it requires application specific integrated circuits or ASICs if you want to actually do any mining on it. But of course different cryptocurrencies are partly distinguished based on the algorithm they use to reward or for how they can be mined. Some of these algorithms are designed in such a way to hinder the use of ASICs and to encourage mining on standard systems such as CPU or GPU. Currently one of the most profitable uh, cryptocurrencies that could be mined on standard systems is Monero. In addition to this, Monero is extremely privacy focused. So governments both in the US and internationally have become better at tracking Bitcoin uh, transactions and because of that, Monero's uh, increased emphasis on privacy has made it more attractive to threat actors. We can confirm that several big Russian language uh, exploit forums and hacking forums have switched from Bitcoin payment systems to Monero payment systems for exactly this reason. And there's a couple ways that you can go about mining Monero should you choose to do so. The first one is through the use of a standalone miner. You put some mining software on your machine, start it, start mining Monero. Great, that's your standalone. The other way you could do is through pool-based mining. 
and through pool-based mining is you'll put the software on a bunch of different machines. They'll all be tied together through the same worker ID or wallet so that all the revenue generated goes to the same user. And through this way, obviously, you can maximize the effectiveness of computing resources in standard systems. A lot of these pool-based miners work on the command line. They have two main arguments. The first is the mining pool URL. The mining pool is where you will go to get the revenue. Then there's the worker ID or the wallet. That's what, as I said earlier, ties everything together. So if you're on a bunch of different machines, it's all tied to the same person that can go grab it. There's additional arguments you can set. Uh, you can specify the amount of cores used. Uh, you can specify sleep periods. You can specify the hashing rate. And basically what threat actors will do is use these additional kind of arguments to limit the resources used on the system so that it's less apparent to a victim what's going on. Natalis did some calculations in May of this year and figured that with an average hashing rate that wouldn't catch anybody's attention, an actor can make about 25 cents a day. Great, right? But you put that on a big botnet and you leverage pool-based mining, all tied together with the same worker ID or wallet, then obviously that 25 cents transforms into a tidy daily profit. So before I start talking about how Chinese actors got interested in, uh, in Monero, I want to talk about what the marketplace was like beforehand. As I mentioned in the intro briefly, it was very DDoS focused. Um, so this is the Tianfa uh, batch pressure testing tool. This is one of the most popular DDoS tools that you could buy and run on your own machine. And this is really a Swiss army knife of DDoS capabilities. Not pictured here is a scanning and exploit interface, um, which allows you basically you scan, find the vulnerable uh, machines, drop the Tianfa malware on it, and then you can use this interface uh, where you can manage your bots. Uh, here you have information about your bots, uh, basically their public IP, operating system, what country they're coming from, etc. Down here you have your target information, including uh, the target, the ports, how much time you want to hit them for, etc. And over here you can select the attack style, so a SYN flood, UDP flood, uh, CC, you might see this if you ever study China DDoS type stuff. CC means an L7 attack, that's just their word for it. Um, but regardless of uh, whether it was a DDoS tool that you could run on your own machine like the Tianfa tool, there were also other DDoS services that you could buy. Uh, you could contract out a hit directly with a DDoS group. Uh, you could rent out a botnet. Um, what became really popular starting in 2017 and uh, continuing on was online booters, which have been popular in the West and Europe for a long time, made their way to China uh, beginning in late 2016 and really began to explode in popularity. But the point is, no matter what kind of tool you had, it was predominantly DDoS focused. Now this began to change beginning in late 2016 and especially in early 2017 and continuing on through now. Why was this? Well the first couple of reasons are not specific to the Chinese but are uh, more responsible for a general overall trend we've seen towards an increase in min illicit Monero mining operations. The first one, skyrocketing value of Monero. If Monero is profitable to mine, we're going to see increased activity directed towards mining Monero. The second reason is that from an adversary perspective, this is a largely hands-off infection to manage. Let's compare it to ransomware. Ransomware, you have all sorts of issues that could arise. People might not pay. That's a big one. Another one is if you hit a big enough, important enough target, law enforcement might get involved. 
you might have to set up some sort of customer support apparatus to help people who have no idea how to get cryptocurrency to pay you. Compare this to a Monero miner where you literally drop it on the machine and then you're done. It just starts generating revenue. So this was one of the big reasons Talos saw a big shift in ransomware serving infrastructure transitioning towards uh, dropping Monero mining malware. But in China, ransomware was never the biggest issue. The bigger issue was mostly DDoS, as I said earlier. But here too, in China, some problems were arising. One thing is DDoS protections were increasing greatly domestically. And through my own research, uh, I'd studied China DDoS for a while, a lot of Chinese targets were in fact domestic. A lot of them were gray market services, such as online gambling, porn, or uh, pirated online game servers. But even these guys dramatically increased their protection against DDoS attacks. In fact, China Unicom, one of the major China state-owned ISP telecoms, actually partnered up with Genie Networks, a Taiwanese company, to uh, increasingly focus on DDoS protection. It's becoming much more of a focus for a lot of these state-owned telecoms. And I can confirm through just my anecdotal observations, a lot of the DDoS actors I follow have been describing that they've had more trouble hitting their targets, taking down their targets than they have in the past. But at the same time, you still have a lot of infrastructure still up that was used for DDoS purposes. This includes a lot of botnets that are still around. They may not be able to take down the targets, but you still got the botnets. There's still tons of scanning and exploit tools to grow a botnet, etc. So basically what some actors were doing is taking this infrastructure that they had been using for DDoS purposes, were still getting a little bit unsuccessful with it and transitioning so they could use it more for Monero mining. Now, a couple big caveats here. Caveat number one, DDoS has not gone away. DDoS is a major issue in China, and I do not mean to suggest in any way through this presentation that Monero mining has somehow supplanted DDoS. That is not the case at all. Only that this is a growing trend that represents sort of a shifting or a breakup of a marketplace a little bit. Number two, Chinese actors tend to take a spray and pray approach. As we'll see when we get to the honeypot section, they will often drop a Monero mining malware and DDoS malware in the same attack. Now in a minute, I'm going to give some anecdotal observations from the trenches of Chinese social media and uh, underground hacking forums. But before that, I want to give a little bit more of a concrete illustration of the shift that's underway. So I looked at a popular Chinese hacking forum, it's called Du Te. Now Du Te is one of the premier Chinese hacking forums. It has a very active user base, it's updated daily. I would say this is a place where if someone was looking to buy some malware or a tool, here's where they would check first. So what I did is starting in 2016, I looked for any topics that mentioned uh, DDoS and compared it to topics that in any way mentioned mining. In 2016, we can see a whopping 291 mentions of DDoS-related topics. In 2017, that drops precipitously to 125. In 2018, this was only done through April 10th, there were 34 so far. Compare that to the mining story, 2016, you have nada. 2017, you have 18. And in 2018, even though it's only through April 10th, it's already doubled what has been the year before. And in fact, at this point in time, is already more than DDoS-related offerings so far. Again, I am in no way suggesting that illicit Monero mining is taking the place of DDoS. I think in many ways, the drops that we see here in DDoS-related topics are probably related to the rise in the popularity of online booters, which don't necessitate that you buy tools or malware from a forum. You just go onto the booter, log in, hit your attack. It's very easy. But I think this illustrates the growing trend in Monero mining 
illicit Monero mining offerings, at least, on underground marketplaces. So now I would like to uh, show you some of what I found in Chinese underground forums. That little penguin over there, that's a symbol for QQ. I use QQ a lot in my work. QQ is a sort of social networking Chinese app. And uh, up here, that's Duta. That's the forum I was just talking about. These are some of the terms that I search on when I go hunting for this type of stuff. And uh, I think the slides will be made available. But if not, I'm happy to provide this to anybody who wants to hunt for themselves. A lot of these are self-explanatory. Uh, self a few I will uh, um, explain a little bit, because they're not. The first is Kuang Ma. Kuang Ma literally means mining horse or mining Trojan. What this means is basically a miner with the adversary's uh, wallet hard-coded in it and implanted surreptitiously on a victim's computer. Mining Trojans and mining Trojan generators represent the cornerstone of the, uh, of the illicit Monero mining market. Another one that requires a little bit of explanation is Chou uh, Shui. That's dev fee. What they mean by that in this case is either fees charged by exchanges or a tool that's sold on like a hacking forum that for some amount of cryptocurrency that it mines, it sends it back to the tool developer. And finally, Ji Chun, that means batch. That means something that manages a lot of different bots at once. So for instance, this is a batch tool because you can manage a lot of different bots all at the same time. So now let's take a look at what some of these guys are saying. So this was in a DDoS forum, that uh, a DDoS group chat that I frequented. And this guy is complaining that uh, all his Linux bots have now been infected by other people's mining Trojans. He's complaining about that. Poor guy. Earlier I talked to you about the Tianfa tool. So I spent a lot of years researching Tianfa, extremely, extremely popular and well-used DDoS tool in China. Well, this here is their founder, Mo Yi. Here he is noticing the good price of XMR compared to the renminbi right now, and uh, deciding that perhaps he'll use some of his vast infrastructure that he's acquired through his DDoS practices to start doing some mining as well. Now, one thing you should know if you start to uh, play around in this space, or if you want to buy some hacking tools on Chinese marketplaces, Everything, and I do mean everything, is backdoored. Whether that's the person who sells it to you is backdoored, or the person who sold it to them and they just couldn't get rid of that backdoor. Either way, it's all backdoored. To go back to Tianfa again, um, that guy Mo Yi in his group chat, one time somebody complained and said, hey, the free version of the Tianfa tool is backdoored. What gives? He said, of course it's backdoored. There's no such thing as a free lunch. But anyway, when you're buying mining Trojans or whatever, a lot of people will advertise that they've gotten rid of the back doors. They have not, as I will demonstrate when uh, I show you what happened when I actually bought one of these. So I was a member of a lot of these legitimate Monero mining forums. And these were guys who, they didn't want to do anything illegal. They just wanted to discuss which standalone system was best for mining Monero and discuss the fluctuations in the price of Monero, et cetera. When all of a sudden, in mid-2017, all these DDoS actors started flooding these forums, talking about their nefarious deeds. So for instance, here's the guy talking about his nice standalone miner, when Mr. Java pops in and says, hey, it doesn't matter how good your standalone is, it'll never be as good as using pool-based mining with a bunch of bots you own. And uh, just to hammer in the point that a lot of these more legitimate miners were unhappy, uh, and somebody later responded that saying, hey, using bots to mine is illegal. I don't think they cared. And of course, if you're going to use a bot 
into a botnet to do your mining, you got to know which bots are going to work best. The eternal question, Windows bots or Linux bots, which is better for mining? You also have to know how much money you're going to make. So here's a guy suggesting that with a high enough hash rate, you can make about a dollar per day. And uh, that's probably a little too high a hash rate for a victim not to notice. Maybe he doesn't care. One thing I love about my job is that in these forums, Chinese speaking actors love to show their work. And that includes uh, just demonstrating attacks in progress, uh, taking screenshots of tools they're using with compromised machines in the batch aspect of them, which is great because it leads to customer notifications. I identify the compromised machine. I can talk to whoever owns it, earn a lot of goodwill. It's excellent. But either way, it's so fantastic that they love to post screenshots. And here's an example of a person doing just that, showing how he's using an HTTP file server, or HFS, to serve some XM rig miner onto somebody. It's got a lot of HFS running. Um, HFS is extremely popular among Chinese actors. We've observed uh, a lot of Chinese rat building kits that include instructions on how to set up your own HFS. So very common to see HFS used in these types of attacks. And here's some more HFS. Here's a guy serving XM rig miner and something else onto a victim, but complaining that uh, Linux speeds are too slow to download it onto the victim machine. Again, poor guy. Now, besides getting tools and forums or group chats, you can also uh, get them on hacking forums where you can purchase them. I'd already told you about Duta, so here's a type of tool that you can purchase on Duta. Uh, so this is an XMR mining batch. Remember, batch manage a lot of different victims all at once. Uh, no backdoors edition. Yeah, right, there's definitely backdoors. He says, this is a hot seller. I got hold of the source code and got rid of the back doors. No, he didn't. The Trojan uses LPK to infect. Uh, what this is possibly a reference to is a uh, well-known Chinese technique wherein you name your malware lpk.dll, make it so it's spreadable throughout any directory with an application or compressed file. lpk.dll is the same name as the Windows language pack file which gets called by applications if you use user interface and some that don't. It took advantage of Windows module loading, wherein it would look for lpk.dll in the application's directory. Um, so this was famously used by the Nightall botnet that Windows took down and wrote about in 2012, and actually has its own page on Chinese Wikipedia, Baidu Baike. Um, he says it's undetectable by AV, et cetera, et cetera. And just, I think it's interesting to take a look at how some similar some of these batch tools can be. Here's your DDoS one, here's your um, Monero mining one, where of course here you're having targeting info and here you're entering info about your mining pool. Here's a, another tool that uh, an, for another forum. This is the Honglan Anquanwang, or HL Zero Day. Um, again, we see some similar type of stuff in the advertising, undetectable by AV, uh, no command line needed, persistence after uh, restarting, etc. But I just wanted to note here this kind of interface, because this type of interface is extremely common for Monero for mining Trojan generators. And in fact, a lot of these Monero mining Trojan generators are uh, actually PE wrappers that call XMRig with command line arguments supplied to the generator by the user through a GUI such as this. And then here you can enter in what kind of you know, innocuous name you would like to give uh, the malware, so it doesn't say, you know, XMR miner, it says whatever. And here you can enter in your mining pool, enter in your worker ID. You can also kill some uh, malware if you want, 
kill other miners that are on the system and just kill some legitimate functionality that might alert the user to what's going on. And if you'll notice, this actor is using this in conjunction with an HTTP file server as well as a DDoS botnet management tool. Now I bought this tool and it was a huge hassle. And the reason why is they would not accept Monero, which was insane to me. How are you gonna sell me a Monero mining Trojan generator and you're not gonna accept Monero as a payment form? Instead, he wanted to use like legitimate Chinese payment services like Alipay or QQ Bucks or something like that, which obviously is not a great idea. Finally, we were able to work something out whereby through the use of a middleman, we were, I gave him the Monero, he gave him whatever, and then I got the tool, fine. It was a RAR file called XMR uh, mining trojan generator dot RAR, I'm translating it. You opened it up, you had an interface just like this. Um, you could enter in the tools, enter in information about the miners, etc., and generate some miners. Great, right? Worked exactly as advertised. Except, I talked about backdoors, right? So there's an additional sample that is an extracted and launched with the file name 1.exe. It checks for the existence of netsys96.dll, and if it doesn't find it, it downloads it from this Chinese IP. That IP, in fact, resolved to a domain called xingugu.club, which was, in fact, registered to the guy who sold me the tool. Truly, no honor among thieves, and everything is backdoored. All right, let's talk about the honeypots. Um, so the first honeypot we're gonna look at is uh, Struts2. Struts2, uh, we had two vulnerabilities for this honeypot, 5638, which allows arbitrary command execution via crafted HTTP header and 9805, which is an XML deserialization vulnerability. Struts2 is an extremely popular target among Chinese actors. I can confirm that within literally hours of 5638 being publicly disclosed, group chats that I was a member of started selling or sometimes giving away exploit tools to their members and basically saying, use these to go attack South Korea because at the time, South Korea had just deployed a US missile defense system and China was unhappy about it. So it became the target of a lot of patriotic hacking campaigns. So let's look at some examples from the Struts2 honeypot. Uh, the first thing we see here is the same infrastructure being used to deliver both uh, a miner and DDoS malware. Here is an extremely common Chinese uh, attack pattern wherein you try to shut down the firewalls, issue wget request for your payload. And here we see the same IP uh, getting wget request for two different payloads, XMRAZ and Linux AZW. So XMRAZ was detected by around 30 or so uh, AV engines on virus total. Um, it makes, most detecting it as a coin miner, it makes a DNS request for get.by-chai.com, which is a Chinese mining site. That's closely related to, uh, according to Cisco Umbrella, closely related to a bunch of other different uh, XMR mining sites. For those not familiar with that term in the Umbrella context, uh, that means basically a domain that was requested either a minute or before or after a given domain and not frequently associated with any other domains. Linux AZW was detected by around 40 or so AV engines on virus total, most describing it as a Linux DDoS backdoor. And this, in fact, made a DNS request to this uh, Chinese website, which in turn, upon later research, turned out to be registered to a Chinese-speaking DDoS actor. Here's just an example of how common that sort of attack pattern is. This is a guy basically saying, what do I do on an own Struts2 server? And uh, here he is, and this says Muma Dijer, basically Trojan location, 
So just enter in your Trojan location, plug and play. Notice S2, very common uh, Chinese shorthand for struts2, which we'll see in this next example, boom, boom. Um, S2, again, so we saw a uh, request uh, to download this S2.txt from this Hong Kong IP. And S2.txt turns out to be a malicious bash file that basically determines the architecture of your system. If it's 32-bit, uh, versus 64-bit, you either get boom boom or boom boom two. Uh, they're both coin miners and uh, both make DNS requests for pool.minexmr.com. If you're familiar with the Mario Brothers franchise, you might recognize this little fella as boom boom. I took him and I implanted the Monero symbol on his face, which is the only design element that I can take credit for in this presentation. So shout out to Talos Design for doing a lot better than this. So we also have a web uh, honeypot that sees web logic attacks against uh, CVE 2017-10271, um, which is another XML deserialization vulnerability. This again is Oracle web logic again is an extremely popular target among uh, Chinese actors as well. So here too, in these honeypots, we can see um, the same infrastructure being used to deliver both Miner and DDoS. Uh, we observed about three IPs trying to uh, download a malicious bash script from this domain right here, ipfs.futk.net, and uh, it was called transfer.sh. And what transfer.sh did basically was try to install some standard libraries then issue wget requests to that same domain for two different payloads. One was miner D, which is a coin miner, which mines Monero, among other things. And other was Linux Sin. Linux Sin turned out to be a Bill Gates DDoS variant. If you follow China DDoS attacks at all, you'll know that Bill Gates variants are extremely common payload among DDoS actors. So here's some other examples of what we've seen. You may have heard of the Jenkins Miner. Uh, the Jenkins Miner was a campaign that basically targeted uh, vulnerable Jenkins servers, dropped a Monero Miner on them. Um, I think uh, Checkpoint wrote about them possibly in uh, February of 2018, and uh, they attributed them to Chinese-speaking actors and also said that these guys had made millions off of this campaign. And uh, we'll talk more about the scale and profitability of some of these big botnets later. But we can confirm through our WebLogic honeypot that these guys were also hitting WebLogic on that uh, vulnerability discussed earlier. And basically, post-exploit, they'd start up PowerShell. They'd keep Windows style hidden so the user wouldn't be able to see what's going on. They'd create a web client object and use it to download a miner from another IP and then start it up. Uh, so basically, so we can also confirm that the Jenkins Miner guys, besides hitting WebLogic through Cisco telemetry, they were actually hitting our customers on a bunch of different other Chinese favorites, including JBoss, PHP MyAdmin, etc. So that's not the only uh, widespread campaign we observed that was leveraging PowerShell. Here's another one. Um, it was uh, widely geographically distributed. This is a sort of heat map of the source IPs of the exploits um, as of March 29th, 2018. And uh, these are continuing on throughout today as we monitor our honeypot. So this is a still ongoing campaign. Um, as you can see, they're from all throughout the world, but largely concentrated in mainland China. And uh, post-exploit, these guys were sort of all doing the same thing. They'd start up PowerShell. Uh, they'd turn, on, turn off no profile, so tell the console not to load current user's profile scripts. Uh, they turn off non-i to prevent the creation of interactive prompts. 
They would bypass PowerShell's uh, default script execution policy to, again, prevent them from doing anything they wanted to do. Turn on Windows style hidden again, so it runs in the background. And then they would decode this base64 base blob, which would decode to some more uh, PowerShell instructions. They create a variable OS to get some uh, information about the victim operating system, create a web client object. Then they would set up their HTTP headers, setting the user agent to PowerShell, along with information gathered from the OS variable. And basically, if you didn't have your HTTP headers set up exactly like this, you wouldn't be able to download the payload, uh, which was called dl.php from this C2 right here. So DL.php. For anyone who is perhaps unfamiliar with uh, American culture, this man right here is named DL Hughley. That's why his picture is up there, DL, DL. Now, we at Talos don't like to do attribution, but I'm 99% certain that he's behind this campaign. <laughs> so DL.php executes an embedded PowerShell script um, which basically downloads a bunch more files from that same C2. This includes runexe.exe and x86.rc4. Runexe.exe uh, opens and reads x86.rc4. It calls calloc twice because x86.rc4 is going to be divided. The first 256 bytes appear to be an array that rc4 uses to decrypt the remainder of the file. And the remainder of the file is you guessed it, the executable for XM rig. We can also confirm that uh, through Cisco telemetry that these guys were downloading these files on a bunch of our customers. It was pretty widespread. Uh, so you may have heard about the campaign WannaMine. Uh, WannaMine basically was um, a, uh, uh, it was targeting Windows systems. It would try to use Mimikatz to nab credentials, to break in. If it couldn't do that, it would try using Eternal Blue, hence the name WannaMine. Um, but according to Chinese cybersecurity firm, firm 360, there was a WannaMine C2 located at that same IP as our C2, which could suggest that the actors could be related. And by the way, we found three other C2s related to this campaign, and if anybody is interested, I'll have my email, Twitter, et cetera, uh, at the end of this. So hit me up or just come find me in person and uh, we'll talk. So now I just want to quickly illustrate um, how much money these guys can make because it's rather impressive. Because sometimes during these presentation, I get a so what? Well, the so what is that some of these major botnets are making millions of dollars. So for instance, there was BondNet. Um, BondNet, uh, I think Gardecore wrote about them in 2018. There were uh, scanning servers in Hong Kong. They were using the Chinese scanning tool WinEggDrop, TCP scanner. If you ever follow any sort of Chinese hacking operations, you've probably heard the name WinEggDrop, very popular tool among cyber criminals and uh, APTs as well. It's used throughout. So they would scan for a bunch of different vulnerabilities, all the Chinese favorites, PHP my admin, JBoss, uh, Tomcat, MySQL, et cetera. Um, and then they'd break in, install some VBS scripts, which would download some uh, miners. But the important thing is, is that these guys were everywhere throughout the world, Fortune 500s, governments, um, even like city governments, just all throughout a large scale, and they're pulling in around $25,000 a week. Another very popular Monero mining botnet you probably heard of is known by a lot of names. I prefer MyKings because it's the easiest to pronounce. Um, but these guys, um, they uh, also targeted Windows servers with a uh, MS17010. Um, and they also used Windows management instrumentation as a fileless persistence mechanism. Uh, it would drop and run a backdoor, install some WMI scripts, um, which would connect to a C2, and then download some miners. Now, according to Bleeping Computer, 
uh, who interviewed some, uh, an expert from NetOne who said this campaign may have comprised over one million hosts. And by February of 2018, these guys had pulled in $2.3 million. So what does Talos do about it? Well, as you can see, we've set up a lot of honeypots to monitor the situation. And through the honeypots, we are able to uh, analyze, for instance, new trends, such as showing that Jenkins Miner isn't just hitting Jenkins servers, but it's hitting web logic, then pivoting to our telemetry to show that it's hitting a lot of other stuff as well. But beyond that, the attacks, uh, the malware dropped, the information we uh, obtained through humans and open source allow us to write snort and clam AV coverage, and also to blacklist things such as source IPs of exploits, uh, C2, and the malware that's dropped itself. Um, we have a lot of partnerships with uh, intelligence organizations um, especially throughout East Asia, as Asia is our focus. And this includes government, cyber organizations, as well as certs. So we can coordinate them when we're seeing something uh, bad, and you know they can go on their side and help take down some of the infrastructure, etc. So you know, let's say per se, I'm seeing some HK, uh, some infrastructure in Hong Kong that's you know delivering a lot of these, uh, uh, that's participating in one of these PowerShell Monero mining campaigns, I can talk to HK Cert, and we can work together to address the problem. Um, in addition, I told you how much I love screenshots, uh, because you know they post basically compromised machines. So that allows me to go ahead and uh, inform our customers. Uh, if any of them are owned with Cisco customers, I can go directly through our sales contact and be like, hey, You've got an own machine, here's a screenshot as proof. You may want to go take care of this. But we don't just do customers either. Uh, basically, any kind of compromised machine we find, we try to go out and inform the person who owns it. Um, it's just easier with customers because we have a direct contact set up already. And when you're cold calling someone to say they have a compromised machine, it doesn't always work as plans. Um, Finally, a uh, language-capable analyst as myself, because I always like to do a plug for myself, too. Uh, we can help with these types of investigations, especially if they're capable in OSINT, because they can go ahead and use various tactics to get their hands on tools and malware, which we can then analyze and use that to get ahead of new trends and write new coverage and all sorts of good stuff like that. Now, what can you do about it? Well, the most important thing you can do is patch. Um, so once again, to bring up that anecdote, when that struts2-5638 vulnerability was disclosed, um, they, uh, within hours of that public disclosure, they started releasing exploit tools and having you know, very organized, targeted campaigns taking advantage of those exploit tools. So it's very important to patch, especially if you're running anything that's a Chinese favorite, JBoss, uh, Struts2, Oracle WebLogic, Tomcat, MySQL, etc. Patch, patch, patch. The second thing you can do is shut down unnecessary services. Uh, so my colleague, Wick, uh, he basically uh, found hundreds of thousands of anonymous FTP servers that were linked to consumer grade, a lot of them were linked to consumer grade digital devices like external hard drives that FTP enabled by default. These things were hosting millions of Monero miners. Um, a lot of them related to a Monero miner worm called Photo Miner. So keep, be aware of that. Uh, remember to, I just like to remind people, not all miners are malware. Uh, mining has legitimate use cases. Pool-based mining has legitimate use cases. The second it becomes malware is when it's, is the question of consent. Is it installed on a victim machine without their knowledge? If not, then that's malware. 
So in conclusion, there's a general global trend towards Monero mining operations. Uh, we've seen this in a lot of global ransomware infrastructure that has now been transitioned to use either for dual use or to also include Monero mining operations as well. This is true for Chinese speaking threat actors, although we're seeing more of DDoS tools and infrastructure being transitioned to use for Monero mining. There's lots of evidence of this new trend, both what I'm picking up anecdotally and social media chatter, and uh, also what we're seeing in our Talos honeypots. And uh, these things can make bank, as I hope I've demonstrated some of these bigger uh, botnets can pull in millions of dollars and reach wide scale. And finally, language capable analysts can always help in identifying tools, tracking actors, etc. And with that, I will take Q&A. That's my email. That's my Twitter. If you don't feel like asking a question or you're shy, hit me up on that or find me after. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much, Dave. Yeah, that was an amazing talk. Very interesting, as I'm sure you all had. Um, anyone have any questions? I'd like to open the floor. Great. We have a bit of time still before lunch, so we should be good. Uh, when I conduct research, the GFV, the Great Firewall, the Great Firewall of China, and the specificities of the Chinese internet are pose a rather pose restrictions to my research. The connectivity is very bad. Mm -hmm. So, from where do you actually do your research physically, here or inside China? Um, well, I mean, basically, I'll usually when I'm visiting any kind of Chinese site, I'll do it from Hong Kong. Um, but uh, you can run the social media, you know, like a QQ app, you can just spin up a VM and run that from wherever. So that's not necessarily uh, an issue. One question I do get a lot, though, is with all the censorship that goes on, how is this stuff allowed to continue, basically? And uh, to that, I don't have a great answer other than that uh, either they don't care or it's somewhat allowed. Cool. Any more questions? Oh, they're all the other side of the room, are they? Sorry, who's looking? You. Um, you said you're informing your clients after you find some successful attacks. Uh, how do you hide yourself in these forums that you are not kind of flagged? Um, well, I mean, in any one of these group forums, there could be thousands of members. And usually, I'm not posting myself unless, you know, I'm trying to do some social engineering and get something for myself. So they post a screenshot. You know, it's out there. It's open for anyone to see. Um, it's, uh, I don't know if why they do that, because it's such poor operational security. But from my standpoint, it would be difficult to detect me just taking a screenshot of something on an app and sending it to the customer. Um, they have thousands of members, so they could suspect any one of them took it down. And some people have started to get smarter, I'd say, and are starting to blur out the victims. But there's still a lot of people who just don't care. Great. Any more questions? Yes. If you look at the price of Monero, it went up, but now it went a little bit down already. So what is your outlook? How could the price of Monero influence um, the trend of these Chinese hacking groups? In my opinion, the trend is going to follow the price of Monero. Um, but uh, even if it goes down, let's say you make 10 cents a day instead of 25 cents a day, it's still an easy profit. So it's not going to go away. But when Monero skyrockets, that's when you're going to see a bigger increase of these type of attacks. Any more questions? No? Everyone hungry for lunch, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yes. OK. Uh, if that's it, then thank you once more. Dave, again, round of applause, everyone. Appreciate that for him. Thanks, everybody.